Yes. And do they move? Yes. Do that move? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So thank you very much. What I want to try and cover in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is really an update of the trial, but it helps me just to go through the rationale for why we're doing this. Um, and I apologize if some of you on the call have heard some of this talk before, but I'm just trying to make it available to as wide an audience as possible. So the starting point here is what we used to know as Wolfram syndrome or even did mode. Um, with a group of genetics consultants, we proposed a change of the name in the last couple of years to WFS1 spectrum disorder to try and move towards the gene name rather than the name of people and to recognize that it's a much more variable condition than we first understood uh, all those years ago, as was expressed by my colleagues uh, from Italy just a moment ago. So we know uh, some of the main features. We know that 85% will have these, but 15% will have a milder course. We know it's rare. Um, we know it characteristically causes diabetes and vision problems in childhood. And we know that there is no cure. There's no specific treatment, only supportive management. And we know, thanks to work done by Fumi and other colleagues, that among other things, it's an endoplasmic reticulant stress disorder. So the issue we've got is that we don't have a treatment for the underlying neurodegeneration. So the goal of, of this project was to try and find a treatment that will stop or slow the progression of the neurodegeneration, not, not the diabetes, but the neurodegeneration, to try and get this treatment to patients in the clinic and to try and make that treatment available as cheaply as possible to all patients who may benefit globally. So this is really a summary of, of the talk and really uh, where we've been going with this. The first report was by Dr. Wolfram in 1938. Um, in, in 1995, um, I, I did a UK survey of the natural history and showed that it was autosomal recessive inheritance. Alan Permit identified the gene in 1998. In 1999, we were able to set up a UK genetic testing service so that everybody could get um, free testing on the National Health Service. Fumi's group identified uh, a disease mechanism in 2005. In 2012, we were able to get support from the National Health Service to set up a multidisciplinary national clinical service for children and adults with Wolfram. So it would be lovely to discuss this with their Italian colleagues and, and, and uh, come up with some joint guidelines based on our experience as well. In 2013, my colleague Zuzhan Naji identified a drug target and then a drug screen, and we went for orphan drug designation in 2015. Thanks to help with Tamara Hershey in the St. Louis clinic, uh, who shared biomarkers, we were able to get funding for a clinical trial in 2016. We started the trial in 2019. In 2022, we put out new guidelines uh, around the, the, the diagnostic criteria in gene reviews. The trial will end in 2024, and then in 2025, uh, we'll be looking at actually getting the drug to patients if we've shown it's effective. So this talk is really, hopefully will be useful to colleagues on the call and patients to understand the roadmap of where we've gone from having found a drug target to getting hopefully a treatment in the clinic. Okay, so we're doing a clinical trial because there is a hierarchy of evidence and the strength of evidence that is needed. Uh, at the bottom, it starts with people's personal opinion of what's going to work, that's expert opinion, and then case reports. And case reports of an individual medicine for Wolfram are okay, but you can't necessarily mean they're gonna work for everybody across that. It then goes up to case control studies as have been described. The gold standard is a randomized control trial, which is what we're trying to deliver with this. And then if we're lucky, if enough people can do different randomized control trials, we can then get a systematic review. But what we're trying to deliver is the best quality evidence to, to whether this is going to work or not. So that's where we're positioned in the, in the types of evidence. Um, and this just really shows what a clinical trial is there for. Um, you may have heard, uh, research colleagues, of course, will know uh, that they come in different phases. A phase one trial is to try and find a safe dose of a treatment and to try and understand that a treatment isn't toxic. A phase two or further trial uh, aims to see if it works. Is it, is it worth investigating further? And a phase three trial is to show that can it really change practice by benefiting everybody everywhere? Now that's great, but you don't want to have to do three separate clinical trials in a rare disease. So we're trying to do an integrated phase, what's called a pivotal trial, 
where all the information about whether it works or not um, and whether it can change clinical practice are in the single one trial. And we can do that because this is a repurposed medicine. We already know the safety profile of the medicine we're doing. So this started with my colleague, Dr. Zhuja Naji uh, and PhD student Sele Garani, looking for a, a drug target. And what we were able to show in cell lines was that in cells from patients um, or that cells that didn't have the Wolfram protein, they grew very slowly uh, and, and they didn't survive well. And it seemed to be related to the downregulation of a cell cycle regulator called P21 SIP. This cell cycle regulator controlled cells going around the cell cycle and then going on to either um, cell division or cell death. And on the right hand side, we were able to show in control cells that they had very good expression of the cell cycle regulator. But in KD1, KD2, KD3, which are cells without Wolfram protein, they had really low levels of this cell cycle regulator and these cells died off. It was then able to be shown that the cell levels were very low, but on the right hand side, um, those cells that retained some expression of the cell cycle regulator had fantastic survival compared to those that didn't. So it seemed to be that if you did manage to keep some cell cycle regulator there, the cells seemed to have an advantage and would survive, whereas if they'd lost it, that they didn't. So the first step and the really important step, I think, for developing new treatments was we had to put out a patent on the observations before we publish them. And this would then give us freedom to operate in order to develop a treatment that we could then exploit. Now I mentioned this because there are examples in the rare disease world of people developing treatments who don't have a patent for it and then it being run with by somebody else um, who then uh, did put a patent on the treatment on a reformulation and charged hundreds and hundreds of dollars for, to make it available. So we've tried to uh, guard against that by, by getting this patent in early on. We then, having got a drug target, did a drug screen. We wanted to do repurposed drugs to get it quicker to the patient. So we selected medicines that we already know will work on the target, that are already licensed for use, and ideally licensed for use in children, and that we know can get into the brain because that's where the neurodegeneration problem is occurring. And then finally, things that were off patent or where we had what's called freedom to operate, i.e. we could develop this into a treatment for patients without having to worry about someone else owning the data and the, and, and, and the, 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 the license to make the medicine. So we tried 21 drugs that we knew about this. Five of them had some effect, but the best that worked according to our criteria was sodium valparate. And this was because it consistently showed an improvement in P21 SIP. It's been around for 60 years, uh, it's thousands of papers have been shown that it has a neuroprotective effect. Uh, we had some safety data on three patients who'd had it with Wolfram. It, it was off patent, so that was great, and therefore we had freedom to operate. So our working hypothesis is that if we could increase the expression of this cell cycle regulator, we can prevent the cell death in the brain cells in, in our Wolfram model, uh, and we could do that by, by um, preventing progression through the cell cycle checkpoint onto apoptosis. And we already know that sodium valparate potentiates some of the inhibitory action of GABA that was mentioned in the first talk this afternoon, uh, and that potentially will action uh, on, on its synthesis and its further metabolism. So that's good. And we also think in Wolfram that it'll alter the cell cycle, uh, increase the cell cycle regulatory expression, um, an increased Wolfram protein expression if there's any left. So the trial hypothesis is that treatment with sodium valparate will slow the progression of neurodegeneration in patients with Wolfram. So then we went to uh, orphan drug designation in the European Medicines Agency and the FDA, the American Medicines Agency. And we did that because uh, that would then give us a lot of regulatory benefits to support companies who might want to develop it after we've shown that it works, if we can show it works, uh, and that we could get some assistance in writing a protocol, and that any company that takes it on will get what's called market exclusivity, so an incentive to help them to get this treatment to patients. Um, so we chose an indication to try and treat the progression of the neurodegeneration in both children and adults. 
And then we were able to get to the European Medicines Agency for scientific advice. And we did this because we only want to do one trial. We don't want them to come back and says, we don't believe your evidence, go and do another trial. We, we haven't got time to do that. So we got their protocol assistance to design a trial that would have all the uh, information they would need to offer a license for the treatment if we show it works. So this was really, really helpful. First of all, they told us they wanted um, a, a gold standard double blind placebo controlled trial. So this means that neither the participants nor the doctors know whether somebody is on dummy medicine or the real medicine. This way, you can remove any bias uh, by patient selection uh, or patients feeling they must be benefiting because they're on the treatment. We were able to give placebo because there is no treatment. There is nothing else to compare it against, just the standard of care, which really helps. Um, and if we did a gold standard trial, the European Medicines Agency would accept a lower statistical uh, value, p-value, instead of 0.05, 0.1 provided the trial was really robustly designed and it had enough power to, to show that this was going to work. So that was sort of really helpful. At that point. And then we thought about what are we going to measure in the trial? I wanted to measure diabetes because I'm a children's diabetes doctor, but they quite rightly said patients are not so worried about diabetes because they've got pumps and we've got insulin. And then I wanted to measure the brain, the brainstem volume to see if we can show it stop shrinking. And they said, that's fine, but patients don't care what their brainstem volume is. Uh, find out what patients actually care about. So we went to the patient support groups and we ended up measuring vision. So this was because with Steph's support, Tracy's support and colleagues in the USA and France, we asked families what they were most concerned about with Wolfram. And interestingly, all four patient support groups came up with vision was the, the key thing that they wanted to treat it first. And secondly, which I, I hadn't expected, the bladder and, and trying to find something that might help the bladder, at least for some families anyway, that side. So therefore we changed the trial and we decided to try and make vision the main thing we wanted to try and improve. And we were helped with this by uh, Tammy Hershey, a uh, fantastic professor in St. Louis Research Clinic, um, and um, Dr. Hochul, who's the vision doctor there, who very kindly shared with us data from um, some young people who'd been followed up in the research clinic at St. Louis over a number of years. Uh, and on this graph on the, on the vertical axis, it shows visual acuity. So the score of naught is 20-20 vision. And the score of two is vision's got so bad that you can only count fingers. And on the horizontal axis is the age of different patients. And each colored line, lots of different colored lines behind there are individual people at the St. Louis Clinic and most of these lines are going from the bottom left to the top right corner. So this shows that over a number of years their vision was gradually getting worse and if you averaged all of those people out you've got that middle red line which is the average rate of vision loss progression over time and because of that we could then calculate could we slow it down by at least half a 60 percent improvement and we could power a clinical study on that. If we did that, we would need to have a trial of an intervention for three years to demonstrate a difference between the average in the St. Louis clinic and the average in a clinical trial if the drug works. But we felt that that would be a benefit for participants because people who normally might lose their vision by the age of uh, 18 or 20, if we could improve them by this amount, it would allow them useful vision well into their 20s or even early 30s at the very time when they're starting jobs, going to college or, or having families. So it would make a material difference to the quality of life of participants. So then we had to think how many patients could we realistically find given that it's an ultra rare disease? And we asked if we could use a special statistical technique to basically use all the historical data we've got previous data on vision loss, the data from the Wolfram St. Louis Clinic. But at that stage, uh, the regulatory bodies uh, didn't favor that and they wanted a traditional hypothesis test as I've described. They did though allow us to uh, bias the randomization in favor of people having the treatment. So for every uh, one person who had dummy, we could allocate two people to treatment. 
So people taking part, two thirds of them would be on the treatment and one third would be on the dummy, although we didn't know which was which. If we only measured the vision at the beginning and after three years, we'd need 600 people to take part. And that was way more than we could possibly hope to manage to do. Um, if we if we looked at the, 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 the change uh, and we measured it two or three times over those three years, we need 400. But if we did it every six months, repeated measurements, looking at the best eye, we could get down to 70. And if we looked at both eyes every six months for three years, we could get the numbers down to 64. And then we're, we're now into the range of something a little bit more realistic that we could perhaps manage to recruit to. Even with 64, we, we couldn't get enough patients in the UK and we needed to work with our colleagues in Europe to do that. So then we thought, what sort of dose of treatment should we be using? We know what dose is used for sodium valparate to treat epilepsy. That's what it's usually for. And we were advised to use the highest tolerated dose within that therapeutic range just to show if there's an effect, to maximize the chances of detecting an effect. And we could worry about what would be an optimum dose at a later stage. So therefore we agreed that we would try and put people on the maximum dose that's allowed for sodium valparate and follow them up and see if it works. But as you know, uh, there's been a lot of concern about sodium valparate over the last few years because of its risk for the unborn baby in the first three months of pregnancy. So we had to make absolutely sure that we followed the pregnancy prevention programs to do that. So this is the overall pattern, uh, the trial schema. So we've got a valparate treated arm and a placebo treated arm. Uh, we've got uh, seven visits over three years, uh, so, uh, sorry, 11 visits over three years and seven telephone calls, and patients get um, vision checks every six months. The outcome measures, so the key one is the primary outcome. It's that how fast is the vision changing? And we try to see if we can slow that vision loss down as much as possible. Secondary ones are obviously safety, but then looking at brainstem volumes through the MRI, uh, vision testing, so retinal nerve thickness, color vision, sleep questionnaires, balance tests, hearing tests, the Wolfram Unified Rating Scale, and of course, quality of life. And then exploratory, looking at genetic variations, how they change the response, um, urodynamic function, uh, and a number of other uh, clever MRI ones, which will look at the optic nerve function um, through, through that. So the European Medicines Agency insisted that you can't do a single center study because people won't believe that it really works. You have to demonstrate it works in more than one center. So we built this clinical trials network through previous projects with colleagues in uh, the UK, Renika Diaz and Ben Wright, in Poland, Wojciech Mnarski, in Paris and Montpellier, uh, Christophe Orsod and Ag Agathe Roberti, and in Spain, Gemma Esteban. Um, and I think this is going to be a great basis for future clinical trials. And it would be fantastic if colleagues wanted to open a clinical trial site, maybe in, in Estonia in future, but certainly in Italy as well, if, if colleagues were, were, would like to take part in future studies. We got ethical approval from the UK National Ethics, and then we got local site approvals in Spain, France, and Poland. We've got a trial steering committee chaired by Mark Pashonsky and an independent data monitoring committee that will look at all the unblinded data and tell us if we're okay to continue to go ahead and then regular investigator meetings. And our lay member is Tracy. Uh, so it's felt it's important to have somebody uh, from the Wolfram community uh, overseeing the research that we're doing. So we screened almost 90 people across Europe. We were able to get the consent of uh, almost 80. We eventually recruited 63. The youngest was six and the oldest is over 60. They've all got um, WFS1 spectrum disorder with confirmed mutations. And you can see we've got slightly more males than females, but, but a good balance. So this we'll know if it works for females as well as males. The UK uh, recruited 25, uh, France 15, Spain 18, they were fantastic. And the average age of the participants is 18. The unblinded data is going to the data monitoring committee. And a big thank you to Tracy and colleagues in Wolfram Syndrome UK for supporting the UK participation. Here you can see the recruitment and you can see that we had a good recruitment from when the trial opened in 2019, and then this flat period uh, through 2020, and that of course was COVID, when it was very hard to continue, keep the trial going. But we were saved by colleagues in Europe who had a really good recruitment bias in 20, end of 2020, 21, 22, and managed to get our recruitment numbers up to the numbers that we needed to power the study. 
So now the remaining participants in the study are visiting every six months for eye checks, um, every 12 months for a brain MRI and completing the treatment diaries for the general well-being, sleep, et cetera, and safety blood tests. Um, this is what the outcomes. So the first problem is we, we could have failed to recruit sufficient patients. I'm pleased to say we have recruited enough patients. We will get a definite answer as to whether sodium valproate works or not, because the study has got the power to do that. The second issue was, was the trial, would the trial be stopped midway through? The trial hasn't stopped midway through, thank goodness. Um, uh, there hasn't been a major protocol beach, breach. The Data Monitoring Committee has been looking at the unblinded data and they haven't found absolutely no evidence for it working or anything like that. So no reason to stop the trial early. So I'm, I'm hoping that's a good sign. At the end of the trial, these are the possible outcomes. Maybe we won't find any difference in the outcomes. And this is what wakes me up at three o'clock in the morning, worrying about this, if that, if that would be the case. It might be that there's a statistical significant difference in outcomes, uh, but it's not statistically significant. That would be tricky, but the regulatory bodies will be very sympathetic about that as long as we see some signal that it's working. Or that there's a clear difference in outcomes depending on allocation and it is statistically significant. And that's the one that we all want to see. So those are the three possible outcomes that we've got. If the trial is a success, well, the last patient last visit is in October. I'm, I'm doing that clinic to see that patient. Um, all the remaining data is then collected uh, till the end of December. Um, and then we have to put a report out to the funder in the Medical Research Council in March of next year. Um, and that, of course, uh, when we have that report, we will share that with patient support groups. If it's successful, we then, in the United Kingdom, go to what's called an early access to medicine scheme that will support us to make the treatment available to patients while we're waiting for it to be licensed for use as a new use for Wolfram. At the same time, we will go to the European Medicines Agency and the FDA to ask for marketing authorization. And we'll find an, uh, a, uh, an SME partner who will help us to submit the package of data uh, about what the formulation might be, about this safety and its effectiveness. And it may be at that point, there's an opportunity to create it into something more pal palatable for patients, such as granule preparation, rather than big tablets. I think this is an important slide, and I wanted to share this really, as to some of the challenges about leading an investigator-led trial. The obvious one, it's an ultra rare disease. So there's issue about getting sufficient participants to demonstrate that it's gonna work. And I'm so grateful for colleagues around Europe and support from our colleagues in North America for enabling us to be able to do this. The regulatory issues, if you're not part of an international drug company, you've got to do all the legals yourself. And um, we've had to set up 19 separate contra contracts for study set up, uh, and that's been a, a big effort. But I think there are some European initiatives that will help that in the future. Sadly, because of the delays, one of which was COVID, some patients who would have been el eligible at the beginning were ineligible after a year or so because their vision had deteriorated too far to take part. And I'm gutted and desperately sad about that. And I'm really sorry for family support groups about that. Um, the supply of the drug was tricky because big drug companies didn't see any money in this. So we didn't get support from them. Uh, and we had to go through quite a, uh, a long procedure to demonstrate that we had adequate supplies of drug and it was stable for the clinical trial. I've already talked about Brexit and I don't want to go there today. Tracy knows how I feel about that. Um, COVID was something that um, that affected us all. Um, five or six centres had to suspend recruitment, but I'm so grateful for colleagues for just managing to get through that and recruit for us. And then we had issues around um, change, change of supply towards the end, but that's been overcome now. These are some of this, a couple of the solutions. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to mention two things. The United Kingdom is investing in a rare disease challenge program of which we're leading one to develop better trial designs that can collect all the information needed into one study and minimize the need for, need for a dummy arm, a placebo group. And this will be using historical data, what's called Bayesian statistics. And this will mean that clinical trials in future should require far fewer patients because we're going to make much better use of the existing data. And it was alluded to by our Italian colleagues just previously and see how few patients we can take part. And I'll show a demonstrator of that in a minute. And then secondly, a European Union uh, funded project called Remedial, uh, 
which is going to try and drive forward drug repurposing for rare diseases by developing toolkits and support packages uh, for people wanting to do clinical trials in the future. And this should be really helpful for our, our colleagues in Italy if they're doing trials in GLP-1 agonists, et cetera. So the first one is new designs of trials. So this is an example of one of these called a platform trial, is that a cohort of people with Wolfram are around the world, hopefully multi multinational, consent to take part in the beige box in the middle. Um, and they followed up in an international cohort gathering data. Um, they start with uh, at least, uh, they randomized into different arms, one arm for one drug, one arm for another drug, and one arm for another drug. They're then followed around to the right of this picture, and the results are all compared, compared to usual care. If the drug uh, is looking like it might work, but we need more data, they carry on in that circle again, the beige run. If the drug hasn't worked, it's the red one, you take it out. Uh, if the drug is effective, it comes out of the pathway and it goes into real world clinical practice. And in the meantime, another drug comes along, terzepatide or something, and it's that little blue box on the left-hand side. You introduce it back into that cycle and you do that whole cycle all over again. And that way you've got a continuous cycle where you can actually try drugs, get rid of ones that don't work and then bring them into clinical practice if they do. And it's a much more efficient trial than having to start from scratch every time you get a new drug along. The second thing is this European platform called Remedial to try and drive forward drug repurposing. And it's a bit of a hefty cartoon, but I'll send it to Tracy to circulate with, with that people if they, if they want. Essentially what they're doing is they're developing candidate future projects. Uh, Wolfram hopefully should be one of those. Um, they're actually bringing people on board and sharing clinical trials experience, just like I'm trying to do today with patient champions uh, and then developing drug development teams but most importantly, they've got the expert as to what you do after the end of the trial, how you get it to the patient in the clinic. And that's all about um, drug regulations, patents, um, and uh, demonstrating health economic benefit to do so as well, which is grand. I've just heard the four o'clock bell go. So in summary, this is the first international pivotal trial for Wolfram syndrome or integrated phase. And I think it's the first with a patient relevant primary outcome, what patients have asked for i.e. to try and do the preservation of, of vision. If we can show it works, um, we'll rapidly try and progress to marketing authorization to treat new degeneration and make it available to all patients globally. We have now got a clinical trials network which we can build on for future trials. And it would be fantastic to work with Italian colleagues and other colleagues around to try and extend this network and, and have this um, future trial pipeline that we can develop. What we will have as a legacy is an international longitudinal follow-up of 64 patients from four different countries across Europe, which will really add to uh, and refine the data that's already been so well demonstrated from the St. Louis Clinic. So major thank you to the UK Medical Research Council for funding this. Also the I Hope Foundation, the SNOW and the French Wolfram Association for being able to get us off the ground with the patient support and the MRI costs and the study sampling costs. And for Wolfram Syndrome UK for being fantastic support throughout this and in enabling the UK participants to take part. And then just the teams that are involved, the clinical trials unit uh, on the left and my colleagues, Renika Diaz, Raj Gupta, Ben Wright, et cetera, that we have. The clinical research facility, the laboratory team, Servan Sarkar and uh, Malgosha Zatika and Zhujanaji, who've really been a great support through international collaborators and then the patient support groups for which I am eternally indebted. We wouldn't have got this off the ground without them. Thank you very much, Tracy. Lovely, thank you, Tim. So we have some questions. Um, we'll see how many we can get answered. Otherwise I'll send the rest uh, later. So ev first one, even though we don't know who has the placebo or sodium valparate, have any common side effects been seen? So um, we've seen some adverse events uh, for these. Um, thankfully, no severe adverse events. That's the most important thing to say. Um, it is known that sodium valparate has got some common side effects, including sometimes weight gain um, and sometimes some, some hair loss, but that does tend to recover after some weeks of treatment. Um, the critical one, the one that we're most worried about, of course, is people getting pregnant and touch wood so far, nobody's got pregnant while taking part in the study. And that's absolutely critical for anybody listening to this who may even consider sodium valparate. 
it's absolutely essential that 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 nobody takes sodium valproate unless we can show it works because of the risks of 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 affecting an unborn baby um and if that happened um the trial would be shut down immediately and we'd never find out if it works or not okay lovely thank you um this is an extremely helpful window for all of us into the complexity of designing and carrying out a clinical trial for a rare disease like WS. Very much looking forward to learning the data. Thank you for everything you do for the WS community. So nice comment. Um, are some of the patients also taking other medicines like GLP-1 in parallel with the sodium valproate? Um, so the answer is yes, um, because GLP-1 is licensed for the use of treatment of some forms of diabetes. And there are some adult participants who are taking it for their diabetes. Now, we're, now obviously, the question is, will that confound the results? Um, we don't think so, because we're hoping that the proportion of participants taking it will be the same in both the treatment arm as in the dummy arm. Um, in that case, we don't think it's going to confound the results. But the trial is not powered to find out whether GLP-1 works as part of this trial. Okay, thank you. Um, a child was, has been diagnosed at seven years old. He lost 70% of his vision at seven years old. After that, it was stable. Um, does not show anything. Can he show progress when he starts to use the medicine, hopefully? So if this treatment works, it's going to be generalised. We the, the licensing indication will be for anybody from over five years of age upwards. So if this if the treatment works, the licensing age range we will be going for is anybody with the disease from the age of five years upwards. And, and we can do that because the youngest participant is six in this in this clinical trial we could do that way. Um, I cannot say on an individual basis, we have to demonstrate um, that on a on a on a trial population basis, it works. And then we have to follow people up after that to to, to see if it, how it works for individuals. Okay, lovely. Last one just before we and the rest I will send um, to you. Uh, in the platform trial, if more than one drug is being tested at the same time, how can you be sure each individual drug is working and it's not a synergistic effect? So I think ideally what we would try and do is have different arms. So you might have 20 people on one drug, 20 people on another drug. Um, and if the second drug shows it's not working, you then switch them onto that first drug, you move them across. So we're not likely to have people on two drugs at the same time, unless the drug has al already then been demonstrated to work. So let's say that if sodium vaporate has been shown to be effective, then the next clinical trial will compare a drug against sodium vaporate, because sodium vaporate will then become the new standard of, of care for it. So that's really the only scenario in which you might test. So, so let's say sodium vaporate is effective and the next clinical trial is a GLP-1 agonist, so you might be offering people with sodium valproate and GLP-1 an agonist compared to sodium valproate alone. But then you won't need just a dummy medicine that way. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So we've 